We're looking into the Constitution Act of Canada, 1867. Executive Power, Article 9 of the Constitution Act of Canada, 1867. The executive government and authority of and over Canada is hereby declared to continue to be vested in the Queen. Black Laws, 7th edition. Executive, the branch of government responsible for effecting and enforcing laws, the person or persons who constitute this branch. Constitution Act of Canada, 1867, Article 11. There shall be a council to aid and advise in the government of Canada to be styled the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, and the persons who are to be members of that council shall be from time to time chosen and summoned by the Governor General, and sworn in as a Privy Councillor, and members thereof may be from time to time removed by the Governor General. We're looking into the Constitution Act of Canada, 1867. When we look in Article 9, it states that the executive powers of this government remains and will be the Queen's. Now, what this is saying is that the responsibility for creating or effecting laws and enforcing those laws will remain the responsibility of the Queen's. She is the one here in Canada who holds the executive powers. Now, we read on in the Constitution Act of Canada, 1867, that these executive powers have been delegated, have been given to the Governor General of Canada. And the Governor General has delegated some of the powers that he received from the Queen to the Lieutenant Governors or to the Attorney Generals of the province down the line. So the Queen who holds executive powers, delegates them, transfers them to the Governor General, and the Governor General has the right to transfer some of the powers that he has received down the line to either the Lieutenant Governor or the Attorney General of Canada or of subsequent provinces. This is all being indicated to us in the Constitution Act of Canada, 1867. In Article 11 of the Constitution Act of Canada, we find that there is a council that has been created to aid and advise the government of Canada. And this council is called or termed, designated, the Queen's Privy Council. And it's the Governor General who appoints the members of this council. So again, it's the Queen delegating her power to the Governor General, and now they're going to make a Privy Council for the Queen, and it's the Governor General who are appointing these members. So all this is transpiring here in 1867. Just keep that in mind. All these laws, all these operations of laws that the Queen is granting persons who are running this de facto government, it's all transpiring in 1867. The Constitution Act of Canada, 1867, Article 91. It shall be lawful for the Queen by and with the advice and consent of the Senate and House of Commons to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Canada in relation to all matters not coming within the classes of subjects by this Act. Article 91, Subsection 3, The Raising of Money by Any Mode or System of Taxation. In Article 91 of the Constitution Act of Canada, we see the following coming out that it would be lawful for the Queen, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate and House of Commons, to make laws. So the Queen would have the right to make laws with the advice and consent of the Senate and the House of Commons. Now we go on to Article Subsection 3, or Subsection 3, and it says, For they can make laws, the Queen can make laws, for the raising of money by any mode or system of taxation. So in 1867, Canada was granted the right or given the right to raise money by any mode or system of taxation. And the Queen allowed this through her executive powers. Oath or Affirmation of Citizenship for Canada I swear or affirm that I will be faithful and bear 
true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada and fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. Black Laws, the fourth edition, Allegiance, the obligation of fidelity and obedience which the individual owes to the government under which he lives, or to his sovereign in return for the protection he receives. It may be an absolute and permanent obligation, or it may be a qualified and temporary one. The citizen or subject owes an absolute and permanent allegiance to his government or sovereign, or at least until, by some open and distinct act, he renounces it and becomes a citizen or subject of another government or another sovereign. We have that citizen, that Canadian citizen, who has been rendered a subject and a servant of the sovereign, the Queen Elizabeth. Here in Canada, her title is Queen of Canada. So that citizen who is a subject and a servant has pledged to be faithful to this sovereign and has pledged allegiance to this sovereign and has pledged to fulfill its duty to this sovereign, to obey its laws and follow its laws. Now in the Constitution Act it says in Article 3 that it would be lawful for this sovereign to raise money in any mode or system of taxation. So that's what they did. And they created a system of taxation, a mode of taxation, and they applied it against the citizen of Canada saying that you have no choice, you have no say in this, you must give your part to this taxation system. And this started in 1867. Now in 1867, there was no Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In 1867, there was no International Bill on Human Rights, or no International Covenants in play or in operation for man to call upon. In 1976, the International Covenants were officially signed. And as of that date, this whole operation of law that they have been using against individuals took a fatal blow, pow, against it. Now, they never taught us this in school and they never taught us this here in Canada but if you stay with me you'll see what happened the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a declaration adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on December 10, 1948 at Palais de Chaliot, Paris the declaration arose directly from the experience of the Second World War and represents the first global expression of rights to which all human beings are inherently entitled. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights entered into force on March 23, 1976. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 1, Subsection 1 and 2. All peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. All peoples may, for their own ends, freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources without prejudice to any obligations arising out of international economic cooperation based upon the principle of mutual benefit and international law. In no case may a people be deprived of its own means of subsistence. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 47. Now watch this. Nothing in the present covenant shall be interpreted as impairing the inherent right of all peoples to enjoy and utilize fully and freely their natural wealth and resources. In the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the first article of law, the first one that's opened up with, it's dealing with the people. We know when we do a legal trace, a legal search, the word people always refers to the citizen, the one who is in subjection, the one who's that servant to the political party or to the sovereign. 
but the people in Article 1 of the International Covenant, the people were given the right to choose if they want to contribute their wealth that they earn, that they pursue after, to a system that is built upon or based upon the principle of mutual benefit. So we are told here in Canada that the taxation system that is in operation is for a democratic society and is based upon the principle of mutual benefit. You see, you pay taxes into this system and they tell you, we'll keep the Medicare going, we'll keep the old age pension going, we'll keep whatever else we need to keep going as long as you pay into this system through your taxation. Now, I am one to contend, and I have videos to prove, and I have evidence to prove what I'm about to say. I am one to contend that this taxation that they are putting upon the citizen, upon the people here in Canada, it's being wasted. And the money that is coming into this country is not being used to support the society. It's being used more or mainly to support the government, the body that's in operation. While we should take this, this wealth that is being given over by taxation and use it for the people to build a better system, better social protections. For example, if you're sick, if you need medication, if you have cancer, if you have AIDS, now people are suffering, they're not covered well. All this money should go for the human beings, for the people of this state. But they take this resource, they take this money, and they use it to increase the government size, to buy better cars, to buy better furniture in the offices that they are using, to pay greater salaries than they already have. So, in 1976, again, the people were granted the right to determine and decide that whatever wealth they create through working, through earning, pursuing that wealth, that they can decide if they're going to contribute to a system that's based upon or built upon the structure of mutual benefit. And it further states that in no case, meaning in no way, no time, no how, can a people be deprived of their means of subsistence. So that money that you go out and earn and create, if you do not consent, if you do not willfully want to participate in this mode or system of taxation, then you cannot be forced to turn over your subsistence to this system. These rights only came to be for us in 1976. In 1867, until 1976, there wasn't a mechanism, there wasn't an operation available for an individual to stand up and say, no, you know what, I don't want to be part, I don't want to contribute my wealth to your system. Prior to that, we were being forced. From 1976, there is an operation of law as a human being, as an individual. You can stand up and say, I'm going to decide, I'm going to determine where I'm going to contribute my wealth. Now, if you ever do fill out your tax taxation forms and contribute to your province or to Canada, when you get a return from them, open up your return, go down and read, and you will see, they will say, thank you for contributing to the social economic and cultural development of, for example, British Columbia, or Quebec, or Manitoba. See, they are saying that you are contributing to the social, economic, and cultural development of this state party. But you, as an individual, as a people, or as a human being, have every right not to contribute to their economic, social, and cultural development, but to keep the wealth that you earn and pursue for your own development, economically, socially, and culturally. That's a right that you have been given. That's a right that you can stand under. And as Canada, being a member, a state party to this international covenant, they're supposed to, supposed to have a mechanism in operation that allows us as individuals, when we understand this and stand up and say, no, I'm not contributing anymore, to allow us to exercise these rights. Canada is under obligation, according to the international covenants, according to their own sig signature, signature on those documents that states that they will guarantee that they will ensure, protect, and respect these rights and freedoms that are in operation. But, instead, here in 2013, when we have men and women who are waking up to their rights, their fundamental freedoms here in Canada, and are trying to exercise their fundamental rights and freedoms, we have corrupt justice system participants who don't want to honor the obligation that Canada has, who don't want to honor the freedoms and the rights that an individual has to stand up and invoke here in this state party's territory. There's another obligation that comes out of those international covenants. It says that if individuals or persons 
present in this state party here in Canada refuse to honor and are removing our fundamental rights and freedoms that we have every right to go against those individual persons again we have a choice to decide this is a right that I've been granted individually this is a right that you've been granted whoever's watching my video now this right to decide you don't have to operate it the right that is in existence you don't have to use it you can allow yourself to be trampled upon you can allow your wealth to be taken from you that's your decision I'm just explaining to you that there is a right available that you can freely dispose of your natural wealth that wealth that you earn that you pursue that you create through working and there's no uh, if you will say obligation okay without prejudice or obligation based upon the principle of mutual benefit so you don't have to turn over your wealth and resources to a democratic society because someone sends you a letter and says you owe us a certain amount of taxes actually the one who is sending those letters that body who is sending those letters as of 1976 they become accountable now because if you write them back and let them know that you understand that there's no obligation yet they continue to try and force you even maybe to the point to take you to court well then they, they've now become responsible for breaking another article of law that's in the international covenant that says that no persons or group of persons have the right to try and take any actions against another individual who is standing under their human rights and fundamental freedoms and when an individual invokes his right to decide what he wants or she wants to do with that natural wealth and a group of government agents for example send letters or threatens that if you don't pay this invoice we're going to take you to court that's a breach of the international covenant on civil and political rights that's a breach of the article of law that Canada and all these agents are supposed to be under, are supposed to respect, are supposed to ensure, is supposed to protect. 